Hi, everybody. My name is Joey Katz. I'm the Director of Special Programming for Boston Jewish Film. And thank you for tuning in to this uh, conversation with a handful of the filmmakers behind some of the films that you just watched as part of our 13th annual Fresh Flick short film competition. Uh, today, I'm really honored to be joined uh, virtually by Lily Emelfarb, who's the writer and director of Suburban Witch, Joey Schweitzer, the writer and director of New Lives, and Hannah Seidner, uh, director and animator of My Parent Neil. Uh, thank you all for joining today. Yeah, Thanks. thank you for having us. Yeah. Um, so I guess we're, we're going to start here because each of your films and, you know, the films in this whole program are very unique. Um, but I think what unifies them in one of many ways, it's that they're all very personal stories. Um, you know, Hannah, yours is the one documentary in the program. So it's even more personal, but uh, the, the people that you bring to life on screen are so personable. The, the ones that are real life figures and people and those that you've created from the script. Um, so I guess going to Lily, Joey, and then Hannah, I think that's gonna be our order here today. Um, I'd love to know what was the inspiration behind or who were the inspirations behind your films? Mm -hmm. um, I would say like growing up, I was very surrounded by a community of sort of like modern and reformed Jews. And a lot of them in high school, especially girls would end up getting those jobs. Um, and I know that was something that I sort of grew up with and grew up around and it was something that sort of became the norm. And for me, I never really understood the sort of background for that and why and that's kind of why when I discovered, you know, why it was created and how it was created to force Jews to assimilate, um, it kind of felt like something, you know, that like my whole life and no one really around me my whole life ever really knew or understood because no one ever really talks about why Jews get nose jobs. It was just like, if you have a big nose, it's something that you should do. Um, and I think... I kind of took that inspiration from so many people of my whole childhood and people I know and people I grew up with um, because there was a point when I contemplated it because I thought this was the norm and this is what I was told I was supposed to do, um, especially with Western beauty of how women are supposed to look and all of that. So I wouldn't say there's exactly like one person I draw inspiration from, but there is like a main character in the film who does share a name with me, who is very much based on myself and that decision to not go forward and get that nose job. While well, she has like conversations with one of like a friend who does get that nose job and the kind of conversation between the two and the two different decisions to do that. And I don't wanna name, you know, like an exact person who was based off of, cause it's definitely a healthy mix, but I would say just so many people that I grew up with because I did grow up in a healthy sized Jewish community. Joey? Um, yeah, uh, well, first I wanna thank you for uh, for having me. This is a really cool festival. Um, and uh, I guess for me, um, so my, um, my grandparents were uh, Holocaust survivors, um, but they, they passed away before I was born. Um, so I never met them, but I kind of grew up with stories about them. Um, and then, but it was a kind of, it was a very, the way that my dad would speak about them is as if they were like superheroes, like just incredibly strong people who, you know, went through the worst and raised a family and, you know, lived like the American dream. Um, but I think as I got older, I wanted to unpack that and... I think um, I wanted to like respect that, but also try to understand what it would have been like to have lost so much and to go to a new country where you don't know the language. Um, and 
I really focused in on trying to imagine what it might have been like for my grandmother. Um, I knew that compared to my grandfather, like her English wasn't great, that she worked as kind of this janitor in this apartment building in Brooklyn. Um, and so I kind of like pieced together stories also about the the difficulty of having uh, children, especially after going through that and what that, you know, must have felt like. And it was that. And then my research um, of different survivors as well. Um, and so I guess I, I just wanted to kind of examine how we um, process that type of trauma and grief and like the different ways that we do it and um, being in, and then also being in a, in a relationship as well. And, um, you know, when you're struggling and your partner isn't struggling and all those type of things kind of manifested in, into, into what became the film. And how? I'm also going to turn off my AC real quick, right before I start, just because it's loud. Okay, uh, no worries. We can't, I can't hear it, but yeah. whatever makes it easier for you. <laughs> I want to hear you all properly too, so sorry about that. Um, yeah, I think um, my dad and I have always been really close. Um, we have the same birthday, and I think there's a really great long tradition about making films about your parents when you're in film school or if you're just making work. And I got into animation specifically through documentary. And so when it came time to making my thesis, I would always go home in summer and I wasn't far away from home either. I went to school that was like 20 minutes from where I lived. So I was watching my dad transition and having conversations with him about it. And like, um, am I gonna call you my dad? Am I gonna call you my parent? And those evolutions and those conversations were happening so much in my own life that it just, felt so right to just process it through filmmaking like I had for my other two pieces that I had to make through school so capturing that conversation in that moment um just felt like it had to be done almost when I was talking with my mentors about what I was going to make so I was just really lucky with how open he was willing to be about it and that we can both look back at it and realize the growth that has even happened since then so he is just a character and I love him on top of the journey he's gone through. So those things combined made really great inspiration for capturing all this footage for the film. Fantastic. Um, on that note, um, you know, Hannah, yours is again, the, the one documentary. So there's not really a casting process, um, but for Lily and Joey, I, I'm wondering what the casting process was like since there's so much, you know, personal, um, connection to the stories that you're telling and for Hannah I guess a twist on that would be since you said your dad was very open to being part of the project what even like maybe after agreeing to be part of it were there any moments where he was like oh, I really I not really comfortable with it or what was the process of kind of navigating those conversations. So I think again, we'll go Lily, Joey, and then to Hannah. Yeah, so for the casting process, it was really important to me to cast as many Jewish actors and actresses as possible because I wanted it to be the most authentic that I could. Um, I got really lucky because my friend Dylan, who plays Lily, um, has been wanting to break into acting for a while. And this was kind of one of her first roles. This was like her leading role in a short film. But, you know, I'd seen her act before and she's great and she did all the reads, but I just like knew the whole time that I wanted her to do it, um, which was super nice. And for the rest of the people, I did bring on a lovely casting director, Rosalie, who, you know, helped out and was really great. We went to the same school and she knew a lot of the acting and the theater majors that were around so she really did help sort of wrangle the rest of the crew and you know bring everyone together so without her I'm not I'm not really sure it would have turned out as it did but she was a huge help in the casting process for sure um Joey yeah so uh um my film is in is a Polish language film uh 
And yeah, that was obviously a challenge. Um, but being in New York City, there's a pretty strong um, Polish community. And um, just through like, I'm trying to remember where I, it, I did a lot of the casting, not through like conventional means, but like putting up flyers in Greenpoint. And uh, there's like a local New York City Polish theater that I reached out to and gave me some names and uh yeah it was just a process it was interesting because um i was originally supposed to shoot in uh spring of 2020 um but then because of covid everything was like postponed um so that actually gave me more time to to cast and to like you know make sure that um yeah, it's, it's a really it's a really hard thing because you um the you know, it, it's, it would have been easier probably to make it in English, um, but because language is so crucial to the story, it wouldn't have felt right. And I also really don't like it in films when they're clearly not supposed to be speaking English, but they speak English anyway. Um, but I think ultimately it was worth, it was worth it. Um, and even though I don't speak Polish myself, I was able to really work with the actors and make sure like the language was their own. and. Um, so that by the time we were shooting, like I pretty much knew what they were saying. Um, so yeah. Cool. And Hannah. Yeah. It was kind of a great process with my dad and also, you know, sometimes challenging, of course, it's a lot of work. You know, I, I sat him down for an initial interview and having done some other films in the past, I came to realize that to get authentic reactions and answers, that I started framing it more as like a mind map of ideas where I would just be like, let's talk about this more so than any specific, like one question and phrasing. Cause then I felt like my dad and whoever else I interviewed was feeling like in response, they had to be so like, like, I don't know, just had to mimic the same way that I was speaking. And I think that really helped him who's not like, you know, really, he's been in some of my other films, but it wasn't like, he's not doing this consistently. So I think it set up a pretty good, base level of getting a good reaction from him and a natural conversation and that first conversation was five hours that was cut down to eight minutes so there was a lot of stuff that was said that like didn't make it and other storylines and paths from our life that just didn't feel like they fit but it was funny because he did end up somewhat being casted because there were other moments later on where I wanted reactions and so I'd have to be like okay say this thing that you would say in German growing up, but like kind of sound like how your 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 grandma would say it because we're trying to make it sound like she's talking to you. Um, and also it was during the pandemic, so it wasn't gonna be a, as feasible to go and find someone else. Same with my brother, I kind of cast him too. Like there's a moment where my dad goes into a dispensary and he talks to someone and I just rotoscope my brother performing. Um, and it, to me, I'm like, it feels like such a family play of like, my brother is the dispensary guy, but like to anyone else, yeah. like, <laughs> probably just like, okay, this guy who works at a dispensary. Um, in terms of challenges, I think there were definitely moments where he is very open and honest as a person. I got my oversharing tendencies from him for sure. But I think he definitely had some moments of like, I mean, Hannah, like I said this, but I don't know. Uh, and so it was conversations of like, do you feel like it has to be gone or do you feel like, you know, it's something where you see it, you might cringe a little bit, but you feel okay ultimately. Um, because I think we even have that kind of relationship where sometimes he'll razz me and I'm like, are we being serious right now? Or is this just a a little thing? Um, so I think we had some of those moments, but he and I both, I think, feel really proud of what we made and worked through them pretty well. Although, you know, when you're with someone, I was living at home when I made the film. So if you're around someone 24 seven, there's bound to be some challenges. On top of that, I was drawing his face every day so many times. So, you know, I think it was just a little like oversaturation ultimately in some ways, but also therapeutic still consistently that way, so. Oh yeah, I bet, I bet. Um, I think I'm gonna go back to a thing that you said, Hannah, cause this actually tees up a, a question that I have for all of you um, because the, the beauty of short films, um, we, you know, we always have multiple short film programs a year um, in our uh, fall festival. We just, we love short films here. Um, but there's, there's always the challenge, you know, there, there are people that have presented films here that are 
three minutes, some people that have presented films that are 35 minutes. And there's always, as, as Han was saying, there's like five hours of stuff that get, has to get cut down to like eight minutes. But um, I, the, the films that you've made, that you've all made, and the other films that are in this program are all really just incredible. But with that being said, I'm wondering, are there moments from your respective films that you had a really hard time like coming to terms with like, oh, I, I love this, but it just doesn't make sense. Uh, I want to keep it. And like, how do you go through that process of kind of trying to rationalize no matter how much you love a scene or a bit of dialogue, like it can't be in the final product. So yeah, I, I'd love to hear about your process and if there are any examples of that and the same order here. Yeah, I I think the biggest was for me is that there's a conversation between the plastic surgeon and Lily in which she goes in for a consultation for rhinoplasty and kind of has that initial talk of, you know, what is it? What's going to happen? Why should I? And it's her not really being sure and the plastic surgeon trying to push it on her a little bit. Um, so much of that conversation was very, very much the real conversation that I had with the plastic surgeon that I talked to and there's so many things that like he said that were just completely like still to this day like my jaw just dropped I I don't know how someone would have the audacity to say these things and I understand he's trying to like run a business but still you know to like make someone feel like they need to change because it's not what they consider beautiful especially when they're like a teenager is just like a whole nother level of something else. But when I initially wrote the script, it was a lot longer and that conversation was a lot longer and I had to cut so much out of it, but I feel like it's a really pivotal moment of the short because that's sort of the moment when Lily decides she doesn't want to go through with it and she doesn't want to get that nose job because it's not exactly when like everyone around her and the whole beginning of the film was like do this do this do this it was not until the moment when like it was actually presented right in front of her and she was shown what she would look like and pretty much told you need to change that she was like no I do not um so having to sort of cut a lot of that out was really difficult because I feel like all of it was super important not just for me but like for the story and how it would go so having to find like the proper moments to keep in where it would still be effective but not just sort of drone on so so long especially because it is a short was probably the biggest challenge that I had there um Joey yeah I think I mean I think as everyone can attest to like making <laughs> making a short is really hard I think writing one is really hard and I think it's could even be harder than writing a feature um i think because you're you're trying to um you're trying to like give an arc and you're trying to capture an emotion but you are limited by time and by budget and you know and and all those things and and um for me i think the challenge was trying to capture these really challenging, difficult emotions um, in a short and um, the, 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 you know, trying to uh, capture um, the, the experience of being a survivor. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I'm sure we all have uh, things that we, we wish we could like go back into and change. Um, but for me, because a lot there is um, a lot of the the story that takes place within the confines of an apartment building, um, which I think was good. And 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 even though it's period, uh, because so much is in this apartment building, we didn't have to like shoot these crazy exteriors and uh, all that stuff. Um, but still, because um, it's primarily takes place between these two apartments that are actually it's actually one apartment that we just dressed to be. Uh, to look different because we just couldn't afford to find another one um and there are also the moments when when um the main character kind of has these um 
you could say like kind of uh, PTSD moments of of remembrance. Um, and originally in the in the script, it it called um, for kind of trying to recreate those moments. Um, but um, after we shot it, it just it we were able to do it through sound, and I think eventually it just became better to try to use sound um, and the environment that the story takes place to, to, you know, capture the interiority of the characters rather than trying to go outside of my own means and trying to like embrace the limitations. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you. And, and Hannah. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Would you mind just phrasing it one more time again? Because I got lost in everyone's answers, just so I can make um, sure. Yeah, sure. So I was just asking, I'm like, I have to relook at my questions. Um, I was just wondering what things were left on the cutting room floor that you that you want that you wanted to include, but at the end of the day realized that it wouldn't really make sense to include, no, like despite how much you loved it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um I think because it was so much about my life, my dad's life, uh, there's just a lot of things where it's like, I think I feel like people need context to understand who I am, who my dad is. And I had a really amazing mentor at CalArts who would listen every time I had a cut and bringing her the specific storylines that I felt were through there and showing her versions that were like cut together. Well, sorry. Um, and having her listen to those even though she knows me too, but maybe not necessarily as well as friends or other people and being like, I don't really need that. Like, I feel like it's okay. And giving me the permission to kill your darlings, you know, and be like, it's it's actually stronger if you let the audience figure it out um, or if you give them room more so than trying to fit all of this talking in, especially because it is animated that you're, sometimes you're not seeing people talking on the screen, you're just hearing it and you're watching something else happen that, I think people need room to take in the visuals because they are also a little bit overwhelming. It's a lot of movement, a lot of boils, a lot of texture. So giving that to the people watching felt really important. The things that did specifically feel hard were just like explaining why my dad waited because um, he sort of knew this through his whole life, but he transitioned starting at like 62. Um, and it felt important, but it also was such a big answer and a big thing in both of our lives that it felt like I had to have both of us speaking about it and that would add a good amount of minutes. Um, and it also was more exposition rather than it was our relationship as it is in the transition happening. And so it ultimately became a question of like, which feels more important and more right to what you're making right now. So I think the way that we spoke about it was important and helpful for both of us, but I don't think it needed to be in the film. I think it was maybe more important for us to talk about just as parent and daughter. Great. Um, I, so this is gonna be a cut, I think, in here because my dog was barking and I apologize. And I need to go take care of her for a second, but I will be right back. All right. See, I thought I did something. I was like, oh no. <laughs> my neighbor has started like banging upstairs. So I muted myself. I don't know if you guys could hear that. But like a few times a day, I'll just hear like bangs. I don't know what's up. <laughs> where, where do you guys live? I'm uh in Venice, California, at the moment. Oh, I'm in I'm in at Water Village, so I'm just like east in LA. Oh, basically. really? But yeah. <laughs> All right, nice. We got we got to we got to connect. That's great. Um, <laughs> sorry, my dog wants to be in the Q and A, so she's gonna be here. You. This is her. Oh. <laughs> her name's lady stardust <laughs> my Thank best you. friend in chicago um, has a plant named that not like full really? exact name. yes huh mm -hmm. that's crazy yeah <laughs> small world small world i'll have to tell um, her I have a dog. yeah <laughs> yeah um all right so we're gonna continue great answer and great answer from all of you um okay we're back um great um, so I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, but one of the things that 
really stuck out to me um, between all of your films and some of the other films as well uh, in this program is the the idea of expectations um, and whether they're from within, within the Jewish community or outside. Um, I think the the idea of how people are perceived and how and the way that people think other people should act or behave is really fascinating. I think something that has impacted the Jewish community forever. Um, so I'd love to just, you know, hear your thoughts on if that was something that went through your heads um, as you were writing your films or doing your interviews. Um, yeah, um, I think we're just going to do the same order again. So, Lily. Yeah, so I think the idea of expectation was probably one of the leading lights of this idea in this film. It's just growing up, it was so expected that Jews were to get nose jobs, and it was always talked about, this stereotype that Jews have big noses. But no matter who I asked, no one knew why, no one knew where it came from. And no one really ever gave me a really good answer because I was always just like, why do we think this? Especially as a kid, not really understanding why people outside of the Jewish community view me as differently and take one look at me in my nose and are like, you're a Jew. That was something I always had a really hard time understanding until I got older. So being able to actually discover and pinpoint this exact moment when this anti-Semitic anthropologist coined that term and created nose jobs to force Jews to assimilate, it all started to be like pieced together as to where this came from, because he did this based on, you know, the stereotypes from the dawn of time about Jews and big noses. And then when you grow up and people tell you these things and you're forced and you don't understand, and then the moment you do, I feel like all those expectations sort of fall away. At least for me, that was sort of the moment when I was like, so this isn't an expectation. This is just another anti-Semitic thing that has been like pushed and pushed onto me and my community and to a lot of the people I know. Um, and I started like telling people about this or talking to my family when I made the discovery and everyone was super shocked and confused. And a lot of people who had gone through with the procedure, they weren't sort of second guessing it because they felt more comfortable and confident in themselves, which is why a lot of people do it. And I'm in full support of that because you should always want to feel your best self. But for me, it was something that they were able to be like, hey, I get it now and I support you and I'm sorry this is sort of happening. But I also felt like this was something that I didn't want to just sit on because no one I knew knew about this. This was absolutely something that was not discussed at all ever in my entire life not at all in any of my like Jewish history studies classes. Um, and I don't know, as a filmmaker, I just always want to say something with my art. I feel like I always have so much to say and I don't know where to put it. So this honestly just felt sort of like a closing chapter on my journey of full acceptance for myself while also sort of addressing this topic that's not addressed and hoping just to, you know, share this with the Jewish community and others because I don't know. It's something that I just, I think should be discussed, especially with expectations, because if you don't know where these expectations are coming from, then I don't know why you would put them on yourself in the first place. So. Yeah, really well said. Um, Joey, you're up. Yeah, um, I, I, I similarly, in terms of expectations um, in my film, uh, what it, uh, you know, because it, takes place in the 50s I feel like in our kind of collective imagination that's even now it's like some people in the country want to harken back to like the 50s and that it was like this golden age and there is a very stereotypical way of um of what being a 50s especially woman um is and I think in in my film the main character as a survivor is struggling to live up to expectations of what it means to to be a wife and to be a housewife and to be American and to uh you know uh be able to like cook your husband like a steak and all these things and um 
And then her journey is kind of expressing how her fears and she says like she just doesn't want to be a burden um and it's kind of and and slowly basically her journey of being ashamed of of what she went through and not knowing how to articulate to finally articulating it um is something that was really uh was really important to me um and although you know the, the film is not um obviously it's jewish but it's not like explicitly um jewish but i still think it it deals um i think a lot of and i think this is something that a lot of um like as hannah as you as you said like what it means to be a jew today and you're kind of weighing against a lot of different um standards and of of kind of western culture um and it's very complicated um and i think it's it's something that people are still wrestling with and i think there are a lot of really great filmmakers who are who are putting that question to the forefront great um and hannah yeah i think i think going back to the point of my dad being older when he transitioned he'd lived so many lives we kind of joke about that with him in that i just found out the other day he got an award as a DJ by Donna Summer. And I was like, wow, did not know that about you. You've been my dad for 24 years. Um, that's one of many jobs he's had. He's been a respiratory therapist. He's done like all of these things and now teaching and just, um, it is sort of so exciting as his daughter to see that, but I can only imagine throughout his life. And he's he also has told me though, of like what it's been like and how he's been fired or how he's been, you know, because before identifying as trans, he identified as a butch lesbian woman. And so it, there were already expectations of what a woman should be that were placed upon him. And now there's like expectations about who, how trans people appear and passing and his age being a part of that. And I think through making the film, it was really important that I was not attempting to capture the entire story of a community that I know I'm not a part of but rather allowing him to tell his story and his specific expectations. Um, and so for him, that did involve growing up, having, being the firstborn out here from Germany, Poland. I'm not, I think his grandma was from one place and his mom ended up being born in another, but both of them being Holocaust survivors coming out here and being their daughter and what that was like, even in San Francisco where he grew up, that it was in, the late 50s to early 60s and that looked like dressing up to go downtown and wearing outfits that were really dysphoric for him and being placed in a really traditional narrative that was again really just not who he was ultimately even already knowing that but again the time period and just knowing who he was and some of the expectations that came from being over there with his family um, that they brought over because he had never experienced that himself I think all made help were part of forming who he was and who he knew he wanted to be even if he couldn't necessarily live it until a later point in his life right um so i think i just have one more question before we wrap up here i as i'm sure everybody who has seen your films um and watching this q a probably wants to know are you are are you guys working on anything new or what what can we look forward to seeing from you guys in the future? Um, you know what, to mix things up, I'm gonna go Hannah first and then Joey and then Lily. Okay. Yeah, I. it's so funny because I feel like at festivals, they always ask us and I'm always like, I feel bad that the answer is no-ish. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I think it's because I went to a program that was so like rich in terms of like the depths that I had to go into of becoming a director and learning all the concepts that it's been a really like helpful amount of space to start making work and like graduating and getting into a job where I'm working with clients. But it's also been really nice when I do go back to making personal work. Cause I do, I think when I am making work now, it's like, if it's personal, it's going to be nonfiction, auto bio, memoir, interviews. Like I'm kind of committed to making that. And so I've been really loving exploring that through comics. I really find just it's so invigorating for me as an artist to make 
you know, small pieces or longer ones. And I'm really inspired by people like Alison Bechtel or Lucy Nisley who are making these graphic novels that then ultimately also sometimes become other forms of media. And even like Diary of a Teenage Girl did become a feature film and that was a graphic novel originally. So never say never, but I'm definitely thinking I'm sticking with comics of exploration for now and then seeing if I want to keep going with that through animation or film. That's where I'm at. Great. I, I can't wait to read what you're working on. Um, Joey, how about you? Yeah, so I'm I'm working on uh, a feature and a short uh, about the Orthodox community. Um, and I, I think I'm but I'm trying to I'm trying to take um, a different lens than than maybe what we've seen in recent media. I mean, um, I actually, I live in Crown Heights currently, and it's been very interesting as a secular Jew who grew up in Brooklyn, but in a more secular area, moving to Crown Heights, and I'm like within walking distance from like, um, you know, Lubavitch Orthodox. And I think I, I'm trying to capture um, the complexity of of the people who make up that community um and and the the sometimes heartbreaking decisions that people make when they have to choose between um their family versus their community um but also trying to like use the language of um you know like coming of age films like um uh like almost famous or um even like sing street or something like that just because you know it's like it's very complicated but i i think there's a collective idea that um there are a lot of problems within the orthodox community and i think it's important to highlight that but also show the complexities of the people who live live in it so that's something that i've kind of been working on great again can't wait to can't wait to see that and and lily yeah, so my main thing is I am a writer, so I'm constantly writing right now, writing a few pilots and features and shorts and web series. Um, I fell in love with producing when I was producing Suburban Witch. Um, I did feel like I was having a heart attack every day, but at the same time, I was loving it, and I, I want to do that again, but I need, like, I think, like, three more months until I can take that on again I don't know how producers do it my hats are off to them I just I'm so impressed by it but I am in the process very early of starting to like produce and direct my first feature um it is like a soccer comedy so the main character is Jewish and it does touch on them being in the Jewish community and all of that but it's not explicitly a Jewish film like this I think I kind of wanted to, you know, just make a comedy, but also something really lighthearted because this project was definitely on the heavier side for me. And I was constantly thinking about so much negative, not that it's necessarily negative. It was just not the happiest project to work on, but important. So now I kind of just want to make something fun for myself. And I also just love writing comedy. So. Nice. Awesome. Well, I, I can't wait to see everything that you guys are working on and uh thank you so much for all of your the the films that you made um they're really special and we're so honored to be presenting them um and thank you all at home for watching this q a with um the directors uh from some of the uh, this year's fresh flicks films so thank you to all three of you and thank you all for watching and take care <laughs>